Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Well, it was bound to happen, bound to happen. The Carnes County School District of Southeast San Antonio closed its schools because there's a huge surge in COVID cases. So that ISD is very small, serves 195 students, but they, sh they had an increase of positive cases by 4%. And about 25% of their staff members are out. Now, last year, they had the exact same thing happen, but mostly it was students that were sick. This time, all the teachers are sick, or at least they claim to be sick. You never know. They <laughs> just want to stay home. Uh, anyway, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing because we're beginning to see uh, school closures around the country, masking orders. I was flying on an airplane, and I counted the 16 people around me, and about five of them were wearing masks. So people are beginning to get sensitive to the issues again, and they should be. Uh, hospitalizations are increasing, not just in the United States, but also in Greece and England. You know, a lot of the countries are no longer reporting it, so there may be more increases, but we just don't know. If you look at the CDC data, it's clearly an increase across the country in hospitalizations. And if you look, it's really been pretty remarkable. In August 5th, there were uh, 10,000 increased in hospitalizations. Uh, uh, on August 12th, 12,000. August 19th, 15,000. So those increases or percent change has been 14, 20, and 18 percent each week. So that's a pretty significant increase. So I like to turn to wastewater for understanding. Uh, and I have to admit, I, this is going to be a, a tough one this week. Because if you look where the virus load, where most of the virus is, really a lot in the upper uh, Midwest, in Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, Michigan, and the Northeast, some on the Atlantic coast. Now, the Southeast, we don't really have good surveillance. We're not, they don't want to know or they don't report, but there's just not a lot of sites. And so you can see we, we have a good idea. There's a lot of increasing virus in these three regions. But if you look at what's going on in emergency room visits for COVID, it's not that much in those regions. It's really in the Southeast, Florida, Georgia, uh, Alabama, and Louisiana. So it, you know, those two things don't match up. So how can that be? Well, let's look at hospitalizations by county. Again, you know, if you look in the upper Midwest where there's a lot of viral burden in the Northeast, not a lot of hospitalizations. Look at Florida. They're beginning to have increases over 10 per 100,000 and it, there are even some counties that are over 20 per 100,000. Here in Texas we have uh, Nolan, Fisher, and Mitchell counties each with more than 20 cases per 100,000 and just north of us, just north of Harris County, you can see the yellow counties up there. So increasing, so why is that? We have a mismatch between where the virus is being ex uh, excreted a lot in wastewater and yet cases are showing up in emergency rooms and hospitalizations. Well, this is the percent of patients who've had an updated booster. White is where there's virtually none. So you can see pretty clearly in the Northeast where there is a lot of virus and in the upper Midwest, lots of virus, but not hospitalizations. Those are the places where there's been a very strong adoption of vaccination in the places where there's hospitalizations, you can see that it's mostly in areas where they've not adopted vaccination. So once again, for the eight millionth time, get your updated booster. I mean, really, people, it's pathetic. Uh, here in Houston, also kind of interesting, last week, lot, almost every uh, uh, site was reporting increases. This week, Still, most of the sites are reporting increases, but there is there are a few that have maybe peaked and coming down. And the dominant strain, the same as last week, uh, EG5, and the other second uh, most common is FL1.5, these two strains, with um, uh, these other XBB derivatives being uh, the second most common. And I, I like to show this map just so people keep an idea. The vaccine is going to be the the companies are making for the fall is going to be directed to XBB 1.5, which branched off and has all these subvariants, which were the dominant strains in the summer. But these branches, which are closely related, but not as closely related as the ones in the summer, are the ones that are dominant now. FL 1.5 down here, XBB 1.6 down here. 
And the BA 2.86 we talked about last week, and we'll talk a little bit again, that's a very different from the XBB original virus with 36 different uh, amino acid or mutations, amino acid changes. And we don't know yet. We don't know how bad that is yet. But what we do know is, <laughs> this I love, La two weeks ago, it was the WHO said it was a variant of interest. Now they've changed it to a variant of monitoring. They've got a new, I don't know, just to confuse us. But, you know, it, it's because it's not spread all over, but it's, it's one that's concerning for the reasons we talked about. 30 sec 36 genetic differences between XBB, which was the dominant Omicron strain uh, in early 2022. And so the question is, can it outcompete? We don't know yet. The good news is existing tests for when you're going you know, to do your COVID test should be able to detect that variant. Paxlovid, which is very effective at keeping people out of the hospital, uh, should be effective. And the CDC has said they think, although they, we think that the vaccine is going to be effective at, at reducing disease and hospitalization for that variant too. But at this point, we just don't know. We don't, we really don't know. We know it's been detected now. 12 cases have been detected in six different countries. The concern, as I mentioned last week, is they're all identical, so it's clearly spread. We don't know if it's going to outcompete. But one thing for sure is the increase in hospitalizations uh, that we've seen in, in the United States is not due to that strain. It is really due to the predominant uh, strains that I talked about. So there's another, just pointing out the vaccine issue. Uh, this is another kind of uh, disturbing uh, point about vaccines. If you look at kids, uh, if they've, the kids have received uh, a, more than one bivalent vaccine after completing a primary series, they are 80% protected when compared against unvaccinated children. So kids that went through primary vaccination and then got a booster are very well protected. It's also clear that a single dose, remember they had to go through three doses, a single dose uh, basically doesn't do much. Uh, its protection was considered ineffective at 7% with Moderna and 23% for Pfizer-BioNTech. Uh, and, the, you know, even two doses of the monovalent were, they were kind of effective, 37% for Pfizer and 29% for Moderna. But remember, uh, the original vaccines were to the, you know, the original isolate very in the beginning in 2020, early 2020, from, that was isolated in Wuhan. Uh, the problem is the kids were delayed by almost a year uh, in terms of being eligible for the vaccine. And so the uh, monovalent and even a, a two shots to the original strain in children, they were being exposed to more like Omicron virus, was not as effective. And, but, you know, what, what I pointed out is with the bivalent booster, it's very effective. They've been very effectively protected. And again, the concern is only 6% of children, six months to five years, have actually completed even their primary series. So parents, Please get your kids vaccinated. I mean, this is going to be a big issue for school closing. If kids aren't vaccinated, there's going to be a lot of uh, transmission. Okay, and now, since my sister's been bugging me forever, I've got to address the flu. So uh, all flu vaccines this year are going to be quadrivalent. In the past, there were some trivalent. Last year, they hit quadrivalent for the older crowd, but it's quadrivalent for everybody this year. And so that'll be, if you'll recall, two influenza A and two influenza B of vaccines. I'm going to spend a little bit more time next week talking about them, but remember there's the way they're classified is uh, by their hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, which are two proteins on the, on the flu, and uh, uh, usually it contains, contains two A and two, uh, two B. The this will be the standard to simplify everything. This will be the standard for everybody over six months. High doses will be for people over the 65, over 65 years of age, uh, and that it's called high dose because it actually contains four times the amount of antigen in the standard vaccine that they give to everybody under 65. Live attenuated uh, vaccine, which is given as flu mist, you inhale that in, in, your, in your nose, uh, is a quadrivalent mist this year, and it, that is uh, acceptable for people 2 to 49 years of age. So uh, just to go over the, the strains again, it's kind of interesting. I showed this a couple of times during the middle of the pandemic. These two wavy black lines here represent uh, a, a pandemic level of pneumonia due to influenza or COVID. And what you can see is that, you know, we, were, we didn't have any pandemics for a long time until COVID came along. And that all this over the epidemic level 
was due to uh, COVID. And one of the interesting things is during the masking process, we pretty much eliminated flu for two years. And so this was seasonal flu in, in 19, seasonal flu in 20, almost nothing in 20 and 21, and then a, a little bit of a peak last year in 2022. So that peak was in December of 22. And we have not, this is the flu season now. Currently, there's very, very little flu around. And, and if you look at what flu is circulating, it's H1N1 predominantly and Victoria strain. The Yamagata strain of B doesn't seem to be around, and it's really interesting. You know, it's possible that because of the low levels of flu, uh, Yamagata strain may, may have disappeared. But we're going to talk to an expert in a couple of weeks uh, to talk about uh, that because it's very, very fascinating. Anyway, get your flu vaccine uh, uh, as soon as you, well, uh, we'll talk about that, but get your flu vaccine uh, in middle of September, uh, late September is a good time. So I want to end today with a uh, shout out. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Hello, Paul. So, 179 episodes was not enough. No. You had to make 180 video messages. Newman. You had to beat Newman. Seinfeld. You're going to make 181, aren't you? I can feel it. And you will take over the lead at that time. I hope you're proud. I hope you're proud, Paul. <laughs> but I'm not here to congratulate you on this monumental feat or to lambaste you for competing with Seinfeld. I'm here to talk to you about a serious matter. The union. You know, I come here as a representative of my union, SAG-AFTRA. And I believe that when you put out a TV series, as you have done, <laughs> of 180 episodes, that the people who are making those episodes should be SAG after union members. Now, you may volunteer to do your videos on your own as a non-member. There's nothing I can do about that. But Lily, Lily, I don't believe she signed a contract or is willingly going along with you on this enterprise. I can't guarantee that her conditions are safe and sanitary or that she's not working dog hours. So, the next time you make one of your video messages, please have Lily give a call to her SAG rep, and we will discuss her future in the union. Congratulations. Hello, Paul. Hello, Newman. We now join our regularly scheduled program already in progress.